Experts say something called atomic sunfish are dropping a bomb on our ecosystem. Imagine being swarmed by a cloud of mosquitoes. That's kind of what these fish feel like to the sea cows. Cape Coral's J.C. Park came across this five and a half foot long fish. It's dead. Wildlife officers confirmed it is an arapaima. While Florida may be a retiree paradise, it is also a paradise for a variety of invasive species, from the well-beloved Burmese python to all the insane river monsters that we will be talking about today. From giant piranhas to fish that could literally walk on land, this is definitely going to be one interesting video. After all, Florida has about 50 different invasive fish species, and some of them get pretty freaking huge and are also pretty fascinating as well. And what better way to start off with my favorite, and also probably the least ecologically damaging, but also most terrifying of the bunch. Surprise, motherfucker! Florida is home to a couple different species of these giant Amazonian creatures, but by far the most impressive is the Black Paku. Their range is currently only limited to some canals and lakes within the Miami Broward County area, but where they are found, they are somewhat prevalent and also get pretty frickin' huge, like 60 pounds huge. They also share their Floridian habitat with their slightly smaller but more common cousin, the red-bellied Paku. Combined, they make for some of the best freshwater sport fish in Florida and are also a definite favorite among anglers. But in spite of their large size, they don't actually present that much of a threat to the native fish, as they mostly eat nuts. No, not those kinds of nuts. The edible kind. Oh wait. <laughs> what I meant to say was nuts and fruits that often fall from trees which Florida has plenty of. After all, a tropical paradise like this is good for growing more than just exotic fish. But Florida also happens to have the Paku's smaller but more aggressive relative, the red-bellied piranha. These fish are known for their massive swarms in movies where they basically eat up cattle. That is not realistic at all, but they still do pose a significant threat. As unlike the Paku, which has very humanoid teeth, oh, that's freaky, the piranha has way more serrated shark-like teeth perfectly specialized in tearing up other larger fish, and smaller ones as well, overall putting a lot of the native fish at risk, from the largemouth bass all the way down to the typical bluegill sunfish, and native minnows that might all fall victim to these piranhas. Thankfully though, these piranhas aren't that widespread, mostly being limited to one lake in Palm Beach County, but there have been many reports of them being found elsewhere, though there's no evidence that they are breeding outside of this one specific lake. In contrast, the Pacus have definitely been breeding all over Broward and Miami-Dade County, and will likely soon be found all over South Florida. Hell, there's even a breeding population of them all the way down in Big Pine Key. And I'm sure all the alligators wanting a snack in addition to all the fishermen wanting a big catch are gonna love it. But unfortunately, it's not all sunshine and rainbows as these fish still pose a disease threat to a lot of the natives. And with FWC already cracking down on banning piranhas, it's only a matter of time before they ban Paku too from the pet trade. But that's probably for the best as giant fish like this simply aren't meant to be kept by most people as pets, especially when they're being sold by a little pet store chain which doesn't fully understand just how giant these fish could get. And despite Paku being giant piranhas with human teeth, they are still far from the weirdest animal we are going to be talking about today. That award goes to the next fish we will be talking about. Imagine a tarpon on crack that could swim backwards. That's basically what this is. Look at this dude. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this Southeast Asian giant is the clown knife fish, and they could get up to three and a half feet long, and are mostly found in Lakes Osborne and Ida in the state of Florida, though they've recently spread pretty much throughout Palm Beach County from the Everglades all the way to Lake Okeechobee. Thankfully though, so far these fish are mostly just restricted to Palm Beach County, but odds are they will spread in the coming future. Unlike the Paku, which is an omnivore, the clown knife fish is a macro predatory creature which loves to eat pretty much any sort of smaller fish in sight, from native bluegill to of course crappie and even some of the other smaller invasive species such as Mayan cichlids and possibly even peacock bass. As yeah, just like the Paku, these guys get pretty frickin' big. And this fact certainly makes them a big threat to a lot of our native species. They're even a big threat to our larger snook and largemouth bass, which they happen to 
compete with. The only animals that are really going to prey on an adult clown knife fish are alligators, bull sharks, and of course us humans, which will eat pretty much any fish we can. Even with the ever-increasing risk of mercury poisoning coming from our native and invasive fish species. Yeah, life in America sucks. But that's a whole video topic for another day. And if you want to learn about it, then please like and subscribe to help my insecure ego. Getting back on track though, in spite of their taste, these guys were actually not introduced through the food trade, but the pet trade. As of course, these guys happen to be bought by little kids and stuff, thinking they could easily fit in a small aquarium. And they're very much proven wrong, as the clown knife fish could get over over three feet long and 10 pounds and they're definitely aquarium busters by that i mean they will literally bust through the glass of your aquarium so of course when people buy them they have no other choice but to release them into the wild this is obviously devastating to the ecosystem and it just adds on to one of the over 50 different invasive fish species all found throughout florida of which most of them were sadly introduced through the pet trade this is why of course whenever you buy a fish you should always know what you're getting into that also applies to really any animal for the matter as the vast majority of invasive species that live in Florida have been introduced through the pet trade, including our next animal. A guy opens his door and gets shot, you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. Imagine a fish that could get up to three and a half feet long and walk on land and breathe air. That's the snakehead for you. They are definitely one of Florida's most successful invasive species as they've only became recently established and could already be found regularly across all of Palm Beach and Broward County. This is because of their highly adaptable nature when you take into account the fact that they could literally walk on land across from canal to canal in addition to the fact that they could survive in very low oxygenated waters as they could simply just pop up and breathe air not having to worry about the oxygen content found within the water that would normally kill off other invasives and sometimes native species these snakehead fish will also eat pretty much any animal they could get a hold of from pretty much all the native fish to even some of our native and invasive amphibians as they're one of the only animals in the state of florida that could eat our invasive cane toads which is really their only silver lining because my god do i freaking hate cane toads still these snakehead fish are a significant threat to the environment after all they reproduce at an incredibly rapid rate being capable of having up to 50,000 eggs in one year and on top of that their parents also guard their eggs this leads to an incredibly high number of these fish making it till adulthood which is pretty concerning for the environment as these fish are incredibly voracious eaters and also grow pretty fast after all because of how much they eat and how big they get it's no wonder why pet owners just like with the clown knife fish end up releasing these guys into the wild leading to a new invasive species to terrorize the ecosystem and unlike the clown knife fish these snakeheads are spreading very fast and will soon likely take over all of south florida just like our last two fish this might be good for anglers but it certainly ain't good for most of the native fish but there's still a much higher species of concern that, while not established yet, might become established in the future. Unlike the snakehead or the clown knife fish, the river monster I'm talking about comes from the Amazon and happens to get much bigger. I don't make mistakes. I'm not just like the rest of you. I'm smarter. I'm smarter. I'm better. I am better. So imagine the adaptability of the snakehead combined with the voracious appetite of the clown knife fish combined with the habitat preferences of the paku and then you get the arapaima. And by the way, this thing gets up to 10 feet long. Unlike the other fish species on this list, the arapaima does pose a threat to humans as while they're not fully capable of eating an adult, they are definitely capable of severely harming a person if they were to jump out of the water, as they have been known to literally break rib cages. Yeah, this is one very serious fish that even gets larger than the average shark. Thankfully though, only one adult of this species has been found in the Florida wilderness. But this still raises a lot of questions as the arapaima is highly regulated in the pet trade, especially more so compared to other fish species, even the ones on this list. And also the fact that a five foot fish isn't just going to magically escape a fish farm, nor is someone likely to release a fish at this size. So odds are that this fish has actually been surviving out in the Florida wilderness for a while before it eventually passed away. Thankfully though, only one of them has been found so far, but this still is a huge point of concern, as the arapaima could have up to 100,000 eggs. And with how big this fish gets, most alligators won't even bother taking them down. And while I am sure having these guys around short term will boost the freshwater fishing industry, long term they would likely wipe out most if not all of the native fish, and even some of the invasive ones, as this unique species of fish is simply just uncontrollable. 
And while there's no evidence of them breeding yet, if there's one thing Florida invasives have taught me, it's that it only really takes two to start a population. And just having two wild arapaima out in the Florida wilderness is enough to truly destroy our ecosystem. Thankfully though, with how regulated this fish species is in the pet trade, and even the farm trade, odds are that you won't be seeing any 10-foot arapaima in your local canal or pond anytime soon. But how much does that really matter when you already have all sorts of other invasive fish species from armored catfish to the three main monsters we already mentioned? While the arapaima may be the king of river monsters, with all these other invasive fish species out in our waters, how big of a difference would one extra invasive really make? After all, we got over 50 of them. And it doesn't even take a big science experiment anymore to realize that the vast majority of the fish biomass found in a lot of these rivers and canals and lakes and streams found throughout South Florida is mainly made out of invasive fish. And that is a true shame as you have so many beautiful native fish in the state of Florida. From our beloved bluegills and crappie to the pike and bowfin and of course every fisherman's favorite the largemouth bass. But in spite of this to the surprise of everyone including myself none of these fish species have managed to go anywhere close to extinction in most of the local areas in which they are found. This just goes to show just how adaptable most of our native fish truly are, and we should all be really thankful for that, as in spite of all these new invasive fish on top of invasive invertebrates and reptiles, our native fish species still seem to be finding a way to adapt, which is good for both our economy and, of course, our waterways. Surprisingly enough, not all exotic fish species are even a bad thing for the environment, as the peacock bass has been known for actually helping to de decrease non-native cichlid and tilapia populations, which put many of our smaller native fish species at risk. But overall, most of these exotic fish still do pose a great threat to the environment, and thankfully lawmakers are starting to pick up on that, in addition to many pet owners as well. Nowadays, many of those iconic fish species such as the red-tailed catfish or the paku that you'd once see in your normal old pet stores are now thankfully being taken off the market due to increased awareness of just how big these fish get and also how much of a threat they could pose to the ecosystem if they are released. Many other fish species too have also been more heavily regulated, such as the arapaima and snakehead which we previously mentioned which you now need a license for in order to own in the state of florida this is a good thing as it means that these fish are less likely to be abused in small homes where they're being kept in small tanks and it's also good for the environment as it decreases the chances of these fish spreading or at the very least spreading at as fast of a rate so please next time you buy your little kid a fish please be very mindful of just how big this fish gets and also be mindful of the sorts of impacts this fish could have on the ecosystem. In other words, don't release it like a dumbass.